Welcome to Good Dog TV. I'm Marissa Sarbach. Today we will ask the trainer with our expert Kathy Santo. Well, tis the season of candy canes, holiday lights, and decorations. It's the most wonderful time of year, if I do say so myself. But while being home for the holidays is the dream, there are some tricky situations that can arise with your pets. My co-host today is also ready to talk about the holiday season. This is Gunther, a beautiful six-year-old, absolutely stunning Rottweiler, and he has his canine good citizenship. Well, to make sure your holidays are a little bit easier, Kathy Santa will be here talking about housebreaking regressions, jumping on people, and what to do when a family member brings their dog to your house, just to name a few of those issues. We'll be taking your questions for Kathy live on Facebook in just a few minutes. So if you have a pet question about the holidays, type it below and we might just ask it on air. Kathy is our resident dog expert. She has spent her entire career as a dog trainer and handler. She's got numerous titles to show for it, over 500 in fact, in obedience, agility, and canine good citizenship. Kathy, of course, has many of her own dogs, and by working with some of them, she has achieved every competitive obedience title the American Kennel Club has offered, and she has earned the prestigious AKC Obedience Trial Champion title multiple times. She comes from Ramsey, New Jersey, where she has a school to help owners with their dogs, and she can handle any problems from big to small that you throw at her. Kathy, it is great to see you again. It's great to be back, thank you. So a lot of people visit family and friends during the holiday season, and that could mean that they wanna bring their dogs with them, which means a a lot of dogs under one roof. It is. It's kind of like having a lot of relatives under one roof. It can be challenging. But you can help with the dog situation. <laughs> Just the dogs. The rest is up to you. So this is a common question in classes, as you can imagine, this time of year. So we talk about preparation being the key to success with that. First of all, I'd love if the dog had already been in that location. I don't like having it be its first time there, but if not, then just bring things that make the dog feel at home, like their mat, their toys, a frozen food toy with their food in it, um, bowls, leashes, and an ID collar, which is my biggest pet peeve. Most people don't have collars on their dogs, so God forbid they get loose and run off. It's hard to find them if they don't have a collar that says their name and their cell number. However, I personally don't put my dog's name on the collar, I put the word reward, because I figure if my dog is so well trained and somebody finds them, and maybe they're like, ooh, I wanted a dog anyway, they might say, oh, it's a well-trained dog, I'm going to keep it. So beware that that happens. Reward and your cell number and you're good to go. All right. Uh, William Ellis, we have our first question. He is asking, what are some training tips I should have to get my dog used to that company? It, <laughs> so everybody has a different lifestyle, right? So if you live alone with your dog and the dog just sees you all day long, it's challenging because as a species, they don't throw holiday parties. They like their routine. So I would maybe invite people over just to have a cup of tea and just get the dog used to people being in the house. The other thing is your dog doesn't have to be the main event at a party because sometimes dogs just want to do their own thing. So while it would be really heartwarming if your dog greeted everybody <laughs> and gave them a paw and shook their hands, I think more realistically if the dog's not used to that kind of interaction, putting them in a room with something they like, maybe the TV on and letting them be calm and then having them greet people on leash briefly and then let them do their thing. All right, great. Janine WS asks, my dog is usually good, but when anyone comes to the door, she jumps and won't get down. I'm sure a lot of people have this problem. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> and she says, it is so frustrating. No matter what I do, nothing works. Help. <laughs> okay, so there is a way to teach your dog not to jump on people. And the first stage, when you don't have a sit or a down or like Gunther, go to place, He'll go to place and lie down when I tell him, and that's a trained dog. Gunther, back up, baby. I know the bed is too Gunther small. has no idea what's going on today. <laughs> where, where did you like me? Who are you talking to? <laughs> so what I would rather you do is not have your dog at the door when you greet guests. And there's a couple reasons for that. One is if the door opens and the dog flies out, you have that loose dog problem. But number two, it's just rehearsing the dog jumping on people. So if Gunther were on his leash and I went to the door and he wasn't trained, my management mode for this would be, I'd put my foot on the leash and stand on it. And then if Gunther tried to jump, he couldn't because there wouldn't be enough leash. And then I could reward him for not jumping and everything gets much better. But really, I don't think your do dog needs to be the doorman with you. I think the dog needs to be be behind the door or in the kitchen or somewhere safe. You do the greeting and then bring the people in. They just think they should be the doorman. Every time the doorbell <laughs> rings or somebody knocks, they're the first one there. <laughs> they do, and it's really the difference between does your dog have training, and if not, work on the training, and then plug it into these behavior problems. So a dog who's trained to downstay or place or sit stay would not jump. But if you don't have that, your quick solution is stand on the leash and everything gets better. 
And that's something you can work on, not even just around the holiday season, but probably when anybody comes to the door. Absolutely. Anytime you want to pre-train that. So your choice is if you're in management stage, meaning you have no training on your dog, stand on the leash, gate, crate, tether the dog, or if you have a trained dog, it's sit down, place, and stay. How would be a good way to make sure that your dog is okay around children? Because sometimes with adults, we know not to pet the dog, and and you know if if you're going into somebody's home, you know not to pet the dog unless somebody tells you it's okay. Right. But adults understand that kids don't always. I would say, and I just did a webinar on this. Ninety percent of all the childhood bites that occur are because of lack of supervision, and it's like seconds, right? So the kid's intent is love, and they go to hug the dog, and the dog's intent is I'm feeling like I'm in a headlock and being restrained, and then bad things happen. So my feeling is kids and dogs should be supervised 100% of the time, but at a holiday problem at party, that's a problem that you have because you can't sit there all the time. So again, I'd rather supervise or put the dog in a crate or in a safe area and make sure the kids know the rule. I think a lot of people teach their kids to ask somebody if their dog is friendly. But as a trainer, I can tell you when people come to me with dogs and they say, oh, my dog bit so and so, they never expected it to happen. So before that bite, if you had asked that person, is your dog friendly, they would have said, oh yeah, they're friendly. They just don't know. So that's not a safe way to weed out the dogs that are potentially aggressive. So don't even ask that question. Supervise your kids, teach them not to hug dogs, put their face by dogs, and then give the dog a break. Because again, it's not their idea of a good time hanging out with lots of people they don't really know. It's the kid's idea of a good time to pet the dog, but not the dog's idea. It is, it is. And the other thing I tell parents is, your kids and you are bombarded by the media. We see kids hugging dogs, we see um, cartoons where they're just interacting and they sleep in the bed and things like that. And so kids have a really interesting sense of, oh, I should go up to dogs and put my face there and hug them. And that's not true and that's how dog bites happen. Mm -hmm. Now we have our next question. Kathy Doherty wants to know, she says, my daughter and I have siblings that are 18 weeks old. How do we get them to stop biting each other? So they're 18 week old puppies. The great thing about puppies is they will sort themselves with stuff like that. We run pep puppy play groups every week and we supervise it and we have the owner supervise it and we teach them when the dog is getting too rough uh, and when to let it go because a lot of times people jump in and intervene right away. But the reality is most of the times with normal dogs, normal puppies, they won't attack each other and have a big brawl. They'll fuss at each other and that'll be it. Now if one's a bully, that's something you have to deal with. But unless I see the play, I can't really tell you but I would let them go and see if they will naturally and properly just say, oh, okay, that's not working for me, let me do something else. Because they would do it if they were on their own. How old do you think they'll get maybe to the point, maybe 20 weeks, or where would you say that puppies start to fight less with each other? Is there it a depends. Period? It's like me and my brother. How long? <laughs> we're still fighting. Me and mine, too. <laughs> right? It's okay. There you go. <laughs> uh, it just depends. If it's a really good match, like if they compliment each other, they're always really good. But if they're constantly like at each other's throats and they're on the raw nerves, then it's not a good match and they'll probably be fussy all the time. But I like to say that they're in adolescence, six, seven, eight, nine months of age. When they hit like a year and a half, they're kind of like who they are and they've probably had better footing to relate with each other on. If not, you gotta make that call. Like they're just not a good match and they shouldn't be left alone and to their own devices. All right, our next question is Angela Brown. She wants to know, how does a senior, how do you get one senior dog used to a kitten? Oh my goodness, okay. <laughs> so again, every time we bring a new animal or into our lives, it's, it's our idea, not the dog. So it would depend on the dog. Like if it was a dog with a high prey drive, even a senior dog can have a high prey drive. So it's a border collie, it's a shepherd, and if movement turns that dog on, then you have a concern that this dog is gonna chase the cat and the cat will swat it and it'll be kind of disagreeable. What I like to do is I have the dog with me on leash, I'm standing on the leash, I have a bowl of whatever high value food is, could be a can of dog food and a spoon. And when the dog sees that kitty, I say, good dog, and I feed them the spoon of dog food. That dog is so happy to see the cat and stay by me that I don't get the chasing behaviors. I get a dog who's kind of neutral. Now, if the cat is instigating the dog and like, <laughs> hey, do happen. play with me, right? <laughs> then that's a whole nother scene, but and you probably have to high value that even more. I would also say to make sure the dog and the cat are always supervised, and if not, they're separated. Like, do not leave the house with a new kitten and a dog that's established and let them be loose together. I just don't trust it. Do you think that every senior dog or any dog in general could get used to the idea of having a kitten around or a cat, or are some just not made for that? So I think you'll get 
I love it or I tolerate it. Mm. And then there's a small percentage who are gonna flat out push back on it. But I think you could get tolerance. I guess the whole thing is what kind of quality of life do you want your senior dog to have if this is a big stress? If they start shedding and then they get hot spots and they're chewing and they're hiding, then you've got to say maybe it's not a good fit. But you've got to give it a little bit of time. Ashley Tringali has our next question. She wants to know what are your favorite ways to teach dogs impulse control? Oh my goodness. I can I show one? Yeah, I think of course, I should. we would love that. I think Gunther wants to do a demo. Yes. Okay, so this is the Gunther's very first one that I teach. <laughs> Am I in a good spot? I'm in a good spot. Okay, so this is a cookie that Gunther really likes. Come over here, Gunther. Set up. Sit. Thank you. All right, so you can see he likes these. I start out by putting it on the floor, and if he went for it, I would cover it like this. And then I'd move my hand. And if he didn't go, I'd say yes, and I'd feed him. All right? I would progress to throwing it. Good boy. You could tell Gunther's done this one before. <laughs> Gunther knows this flat out and multiples. What I like about this is it doesn't require me to say leave it. I mean, he does have a leave it command. But my concern is if you, let's say you're taking medication and it spills on the counter and you don't notice one drops in front of the dog, if I don't see it, I can't say leave it. Therefore, my dog is probably going to grab that. Plus, if my holiday guests come over, they don't know to say the commands either. So they drop something. They don't have to think about, oh, what do I say? The dog just knows. If something hits the ground, you do not grab it. And this is the foundation for everything I teach. All obedience commands, everything that starts with this one thing. And then we grow it into the hand because I don't want them taking food out of people's hands. So how do you do it when it's that first one, Kathy, when the first time that you put that treat in it front of them? It looks a lot like rugby because <laughs> you're like covering it, yeah. right? Um, and then the dog keeps trying and you keep covering and you keep covering and at some point the dog stops and says, hmm, I can't have that cookie. And then you mark it and you say yes and you feed it right away. But it, it's a lot of blocking and you're like, oh, this doesn't work. But you keep at it and then it happens. So it basically shows the dog you're the one that's deciding when they get that treat. Correct. I, I control everything, all the rewards, freedom, fun, petting, food, toys, all of it. And if you want something, you have to do something for me. This, by the way, transfers to doorway manners, which you saw earlier, yes. and grabbing food from people. And it's just, it's an all around solid first thing to teach your dog about impulse control. I think that's going to be a great one around the holidays too, because kids are always dropping food off their plates, cookies, everything. You see them walking around, there's like a trail of crumbs around them. Exactly. <laughs> and we're teaching this next level for my advanced classes, where if somebody offers your dog food, the dog can't take it, which is great. And we do that with service dogs too, like guide dogs. They're not allowed to take food from people. Gunther's great with that. He, he realizes that. But I know Gunther's had a lot of training to get to this point. Yes, he has. Good boy, Gunther. <laughs> All right, Kathy. Next question is from Katie Riley. She says, how do I get my Norfolk Terrier to stop barking when I'm on the phone? Oh, my goodness. Okay, so first of all, I love Norfolk Terriers. They're <laughs> awesome. And yes, they like to bark. So you have to think about why a dog barks first before you can fix it. And that's pretty much a good way to solve any problem. What is the dog getting from this behavior that makes him want to continue it? I would imagine that if your dog is barking, you get off the phone. <laughs> or you maybe address them. You're like, stop it. Or, or go to another room. or Right. Or some people go, here's a bone. And the dog says, oh, I know how I get bones. When she's on the phone, I need to bark. So that's the way of you've sort of reverse trained your dog to do it. But if my dog was barking, I would say, oh, hold on a second. First of all, it would be a fake phone call. And then I'd say, oh, my goodness, you want to go in your crate or gated area or special room? Okay, special baby. room. <laughs> and I'll put you in there. But you say it like that, and the dog is like, Oh my God, she's so stupid. Like a little miscommunication between the species. So an unexpected outcome for the dog changes behavior. But if it's the same thing all the time, then you're gonna keep getting it, especially if it's a reward. So definitely no giving the bone when they start barking. No. Versus and reinforcing bad behavior. It does, and people do that for biting too. Yeah. They're like, my puppy bites me and I give him a bone. I'm like, well, you're the vending machine. <laughs> A good, there you go. That's a good example. <laughs> okay, this is another question that I have actually. During the holiday season, we are all guilty of this, is we don't exercise enough. We are eating more food, not getting out enough. It's cold out sometimes. You don't want to go out there. Not enough time to exercise. What could this mean for your dog? Because if you are not exercising, you're probably not taking them for a walk. You probably don't have time. Yeah, and then they physically don't get the exercise they need, and so then mentally they don't get the stimulation either. And so you get... If you had behavior problems, which I'm sure you don't, um, <laughs> other people do, they get worse because the dog needs exercise mentally and physically. So there's a really cool thing called a flirt pole. 
basically it's a really long pole and it has a sort of a cord at the end with a toy. And it's kind of like a lunge whip for horses. Mm -hmm. And you hold it and you teach the dog to run after that toy. So even if you're cold and even if you can't get out because it's bad weather or you have a child who you're afraid the dog, when they play with the toy, gets too rough, you can stand literally in one place and move that toy in a circle around your body and the dog goes around and around and around, just like lunging a horse. So if you teach that skill, then you have a quick way to exercise the dog even if you can't go somewhere. Ashley Tringali has another question, which might go right off of this one, because that, okay. that seems like a little bit of mental stimulation, too. Yes. She is asking, what are some good mental stimulation games for bad weather? Exactly. Well, the flir pole thing, you could go out in your yard or somewhere, but you can't do it in your house. So here's a quick trick I do. All right, you get a muffin tin, and you put some high-value treats, and I mean like little pieces of string cheese, whatever, check with your vet, blah, blah, blah. But put tennis balls on top of those treats and put it down. And the dog has to learn to move the tennis ball to get underneath to get to the treat. Now, if you have a really ball-oriented dog, obviously it's not the best game for you. You could cover it with something else. But I'm getting the dog to think outside the box, literally, and move things to get to what they want. If your dog is like what my dog did, which is he just picked up the tray and dumped it <laughs> and got all the food. He's smart. He's, he's smart. <laughs> um, I took it and I put it in the most recent Amazon empty box I had. And then he couldn't do that because he okay. had to get his head in and do it. I do hide games all the time. Like if you have more than one person in your family, have them show the dog a treat, have them run through the house and hide. And then you say, oh, go find him. And then they can say the dog's name. And then they're running through the house and looking. And it's just, it's physical, but it's also mental and it's fun. And I think it's relationship building. People are so focused on getting the sit and getting the exercise, but they don't realize that what you're doing right now, this is relationship building. And they need to have that with the dog, too. Yeah. Right, Gunter? Gunter? <laughs> uh, do you see any issues um, with housebreaking regression, specifically with younger dogs around the holidays? I do. And it's pretty much because people don't have time or their to-do list blows up and they don't think about, oh, I should walk the dog, or they depend on the kids. They're like, I'm going out shopping. Make sure you walk the dog. And the kids are busy, whatever they're doing, homework, hopefully. <laughs> uh, and that just goes by the wayside. And the worst cases are small dogs. Because a small dog can go behind the couch and have an accent that you don't find in real time. Gunther has an accent you're going to know within seconds, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's a small dog issue. And you just have to up your level of maintenance. And if that means that your dog has a little more confinement because you know you're off your game, then that's what you have to do. Otherwise, the housebreaking problem can persist forever, especially with tiny dogs. Another question about jumping. Um, Julie Wiley wants to know, when company arrives at our house, our dogs really like to greet them by jumping on them. <laughs> of course, the dogs probably think this is a nice thing. <laughs> right, right. Um, how do we stop this behavior? OK, so I would do the same exact thing. I would, number one, let all your company know that your dog is in training. So when they ring the bell, and they're like, hurry up, where are you? You're, you're setting your dog up for success. So that means you're gating, you're confining, you're crating, you're doing what you have to do. I also teach the dog before the company comes that when the sound of the doorbell happens, if they run to a place or they run to the kitchen, I'm gonna throw a handful of whatever, stew meat, a hamburger, like high value stuff that they never get. So my dog's response to the doorbell and knocking is way different than other people's. They think move away from it. Your dogs think go, go to it. Go towards it, yeah. The other thing is you have to train your guests, right? So if your dog happens to get to the door and happens to try to jump and you didn't have the leash on or the confinement, you gotta tell them ignore the dog. The dog is still getting a reward because they're getting that body contact, but at least you're not adding to it by petting it and going, I don't mind. That's like the worst thing to say. When somebody's dogs jump on you and they're trying to stop them and then the company goes, I don't it's mind. Okay. Yeah. The, the owner's like, no, I do mind. <laughs> so it's just thinking ahead. It's like planning. Do you have ice for the party? Do you have um, whatever you're going to serve? And do you have a confinement area for your dog? Which we have time now, right? We have a couple weeks before all the holidays start. Hi, Gunther. <laughs> you can start confining your dog in that area and teaching them how awesome it is. Special toys that they never see, things like that, have the TV on, a fan, white noise, all that stuff. Your dog is going to love it so much. And as somebody who's had a lot of parties at the house, 
I would like a space like that. Very true. Just to get, get away, away from calm everybody. down. A zen spot away there from you everybody. Go. True. Hang out with the dog. <laughs> so, Kathy, how would you kind of determine, because when, when you're saying you have company coming and you want to create them, how is that different from having the mailman show up and having your dog bark and them thinking, I bark and the mailman goes away? What's the difference? So, the day-to-day -day operations of your household, meaning the, the doorbell rings and the dog is barking, that's actually a training session. And what I would tell people to do, because right now I think they realize they have a lot of issues with their dogs because they're like, oh my God, I'm having people over. My dog is a hot mess. Between <laughs> now and next week, you probably can't train your dog to do a down and a wait, but you can condition them to have a different response to the doorbell. So number one, my dogs don't get access to the front of the house to see out the window because a lot of dogs stare out the window and that creates all that barking. And then they pull on a walk because they're frustrated with that glass door, that glass wall between them and what they want. So you take them on a walk and they start pulling you. So my dogs never look out the window, they never bark, they're just on the other side of the house. If you can't have that happen, then you just have to decide where you could confine your dogs so you're not encouraging that behavior. But I'm telling you, if you teach them that the doorbell ringing or knocking means something good is gonna happen, like a high value treat, they're gonna give up the door. Because even though they get that adrenaline rush and the barking, they're not gonna get the high value stuff that you're gonna give them if they show up in the kitchen. And let's be honest, they're all food oriented. <laughs> they are. Now somebody is definitely gonna say, but my dog's not food oriented. Fine, we'll find something. I mean, <laughs> you've gotta look outside the box and think about like jar baby food. Um, I don't know, dogs love hamburgers, like especially <laughs> fast food hamburgers, and they're probably totally unhealthy for yeah. them. And I feed raw, so I mean, I get the health part of it, but you know, sometimes you gotta just step it up. Freeze dried livers, stuff like that. Just teach your dog that in this area, good stuff happens, and in that area, nothing good happens. All right, well, Bethany Clayson has our next question. She says, I have two dogs. When I walk them, they go crazy when other dogs go by. How can I get them to stay calm? I would say we've got to walk them separately, which, oh, everybody hates that answer because it's more time, I'm sorry. But I would see how they are separately. And if I can walk them separately and they blow up, then I can teach them individually, don't do that. And there's a lot of reasons why they're barking, right? So if I saw the dogs, if you sent a video, I could say, oh, that's aggression, oh, that's fear. You can't just throw out a solution for this because it could be the wrong one. I will, though, tell you, as a rule, most people, when they take their dogs for a walk, they're kind of the Uber driver. You know when you get out of the car and you just leave? That's what the dogs think when they leave the house with you. They're like, see ya, and they go. <laughs> so there's zero communication between the time that you've left the house until you get back to the house. And I think that the dog doesn't really think you're relevant at all. And so when you finally address them during the blow up, they're like, oh, hey, you're still here. And like, leave me alone because I'm doing something. There's other things going on that they're paying attention exactly. to. Exactly. So you have to engage them during the walk. So my walks, especially with dogs that I'm rehabbing like that, are training walks. We'll walk and I'll ask for a sit. We'll walk and I'll run backwards and I'll say their name and I'll reward them. And Gunther was trained like this in the beginning, but there is pretty much no food needed to get him to respond. But when I'm training a dog at this level, I'm absolutely walking out the house with bacon in my pocket because whatever you think is awesome is not as awesome as what I have. You will get off the food. I think people don't use rewards like this because they're afraid it's gonna be a forever thing, but it's not. It is just a way to get your dog's attention in a high arousal state, which is what it sounds like she's having. I'd also practice walking in places where there wasn't a lot of whatever distracts that dog. So I would drive myself to an empty parking lot, take my dogs for a walk. That's my management piece, but on the back side of it, I'm training the dog to engage more with me on a walk. I'm teaching basic obedience, things like that. And you won't always have to walk around with the bacon in your pocket. You will not, unless you're hungry. <laughs> unless you need that bacon. This bacon is really good. <laughs> well, Chris Cockrell has our next question. How do you help with separation anxiety? I'm sure you deal with this a lot in your school. I do. Um, so separation anxiety is one of the hardest things to deal with because the the way we reform it requires you to not leave the dog alone ever which means if you need to leave the house you need to have somebody staying with the dog or you need to bring them to a daycare or things like that you have to talk to your vet and find out if it's true separation anxiety because the biggest indicator to me that it is that is dogs who are biting the walls, they're defecating, they're trying to break through glass windows. A lot of people define separation anxiety as the dog just not wanting them to leave, but true separation anxiety comes with destruction of your house, they break out of crates, it's awful. So what I would do is find a trainer, somebody who works with this kind of stuff in your area, 
and bring the dog to them, let them do a deep dive into that, and also speak to your vet about it because some pharmaceutical are appropriate in situations like that. It's really sad to me. It's, it's, we deal with a lot of that and we have a good success rate, but the compliance has to be pretty much 100%. So if you're in the New York, New Jersey area, you can help them out? Absolutely, <laughs> I can. And if you're not, send an email and I'll get you to people who can. That would be great. So Mary Leader Price has our last question. Um, I have a three-month-old puppy. Need to know how do I get him to stop biting me? I know he's playing, but it sure hurts. And when I tell him no, he barks back at me. Sassy. All right, so <laughs> a I have a, a three-month-old puppy too. Yay! And I'm going to tell you what not to do. The biggest mistake people make is when their dog bites them, like we said earlier, they give them something to chew on. And it's a great idea, but if you don't put a little buffer of time between the bite and the reward, they're going to think of it as exactly that. I bite them and I get a reward. Sometimes the way you play with a puppy kicks them into that bitey thing. Sometimes you know, you're roughhousing with them, and, and I see this all the time. You get on the floor, and you're getting them cranked up, and then they're biting, you're like, oh my gosh, they're biting me. Well, don't get them that cranked up. You kind of did it, yeah. You kind of <laughs> did it to yourself. I like tug toys, I like long tug toys, so the puppy can be at one end, and I'm at the other. The flirt pull is an awesome thing as well. Keeps the dog away from you, gets them running around. Make sure the exercise is there, and maybe give your dog some food puzzles, too. You can fill them either with food that the dog was going to eat, like kibble that you've mushed and stuffed in there and frozen. You could put peanut butter in it, just anything like that, because it's not necessarily teething, it's just the dog needing to do something. And you have to keep an eye on them 100% of the time. I find, though, that kids are really interesting to dogs because they run around, they squeal, and they make cool noises when you bite them. Saying no, as she said she does, it, it can turn a dog on because you're like, no, and they're like, oh, yeah, let's go. <laughs> oh, I, I can show you, yeah. <laughs> and then they start running wheelies. So, but I'd say 85% of the time, the biggest reasons puppies are mouthing is because they're overtired. So if a puppy is born today, in a year, they're an adult. Imagine if somebody had a baby today and in a year they were 21. That's the amount of growth that a puppy does mentally and physically. So they're overtired most of the time. And people who work from home and are stay at home parents, they have this guilt that they're not gonna put the dog in for a nap, but they really need to do it. And when you do, you see a huge reduction in the mouthing and the naughty behavior. Such an interesting idea. Your puppies need naps just like kids. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, Kathy, well, thank you so much. We don't have time for any more questions from Facebook, but if anybody has any, um, Kathy will be back in, in the new year, so we will have you back and hopefully you can answer some more questions for us. I would us. love that, thank you. Well, you can download Kathy's free ebook today if you would like some more help. It is called The 10 Best Things to teach your puppy or dog. She's also on Facebook at Kathy Santos Dog Training. I'm Marissa Sarbag. Thank you so much for joining me today. And thank you to my co-host, Gunther. He's done a very great job. You can tell he was trained by you. Absolutely. <laughs> Be sure to download AKC TV on Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon Fire. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as well. We are off next week for Thanksgiving. So enjoy the holiday with those you love. We know we will be. We'll be back at the same time in two weeks with our sports edition. Don't miss it. AKC TV, it is good dog TV. We leave you with our good dog moment of the week. Now this Husky definitely feeling the season. <laughs> Send us your good dog moment to akc.tv slash submit.